This video was produced with New Faller trainees to demonstrate the New Faller certification process and illustrate how to determine the qualifications of a certified faller. Whether a faller has 30 years or 30 days of experience, he is always assessed to the same falling standard. And maintaining that standard is critical to prevent injuries and fatalities. So WorkSafe BC developed a BC Faller Training Standard 23-page faller evaluation form to maintain the principles of falling timber safely and productively. The key to completing it with accuracy and efficiency is developing a method that is easy and consistent for you. That means practice makes perfect. And to assist you further, the form is laid out so that it can be completed easier over a period of time. Let's take a look. The entire front page of an evaluation can be used as a guide to get valuable information when hiring a faller. Simple things like name, address, phone number, where he's worked, what types of timber he's worked in and ground conditions. Assessing the mental and physical well-being of the faller starts during the initial phone call and continues throughout the evaluation and thereafter while he's working for you. The completion of the evaluation can be conducted all at once or, better yet, over a period of time during regular inspections. Turning the page, we get to part one, personal protective equipment. When hiring a faller, ask them to show up at your office or marshalling point with their PPE and their falling gear for a qualified falling supervisor to inspect. This will prevent a faller from going out to the work site with damaged, out of date, or missing gear so your operations can continue running smoothly. Three years old, you're allowed five years on your hard hat. Huh? The BC Forest Safety Council encourages fallers to wear safety glasses in conjunction with a full face screen. However, just wearing a full face screen meets the acceptable standard. Part 2. Mental and Physical Well-Being The mental state of a faller starts with the falling supervisor. It's important that the faller stay focused on the job and the task at hand. Therefore, communicating in a positive, professional manner will keep the faller at ease. Lots of broken understory, wind falls on the ground from the last wind we had. It's important to check if your faller is taking care of himself. Is he staying hydrated throughout the day? Is he eating properly? Does he stretch during and at the end of the day? And is he working appropriately to reduce MSI? Is the faller wearing suitable clothing for the temperature? And most importantly, are they showing any signs of fatigue, depression, anxiety, or intoxication? These should all be noted in part two. Part three. Man check procedures and transportation. Your follow must recognize the importance of having qualified assistance readily available and be able to provide assistance in a timely manner. Therefore, the faller must regulate the active falling area and no safe work procedures for rendering assistance. The faller must be transported to the work site in a suitable vehicle that has a pre-trip inspection, is in good mechanical order, and is able to secure and stow tools and equipment separately from the passengers. Part 4. First Aid and Emergency Response Plan The faller must be able to access first aid supplies, know how to give first aid if they are acting as qualified assistants, and be able to initiate the emergency response procedures. Part 5. Review Plan and Initial Safety Meeting It's important that the faller participates in the initial safety meeting so they can demonstrate understanding of all site-specific hazards and procedures for entering and working in the active falling area. Part 6. Adverse weather conditions. Given extreme weather conditions like fog, lightning, snow, wind, rain, and extreme temperatures, the fallers must be aware of site-specific shutdown criteria and have emergency access and egress routes established and marked. Part 7. Identifying hand tools and equipment. For MSI purposes, an axe is intended to be used with two hands when the faller is striking wedges. The axe head must be pinned or secured so it doesn't fly off, and the axe handle should be painted with a bright color so it's always visible. The axe is not intended to be carried on a faller's belt. However, if it is carried on a belt, it needs to be in an acceptable carrying device. Most importantly though, an axe must be available at the base of every tree being felled. In addition, the faller should be equipped with a minimum of three wedges on person and have spare wedges in their pack. 
Let me check for crack, and he has two spares. Part A, determine chainsaw suitability. The faller's chainsaw must be in good working condition and have a manufacturer's full wrap handlebars, adequate falling dogs, and meet the CSA standard. The safety features, which include a functioning chain brake, chain catcher, and anti-lock trigger must all be in working order. The bar length should always be compatible with the timber size, and a spare bar and chain must be readily available. Fallers are encouraged to keep a spare power head or a complete chainsaw at the falling site for safety and reducing downtime. Part 9. Practice Chainsaw Maintenance The faller must keep the chainsaw properly maintained at all times, and fallers should have their chain properly tensioned, keep the chain filed evenly, and use the raker gauge consistently to ensure safe, smooth yeah, cutting and to meet the manufacturer's specifications. Take them off. Take it. Part 10. Demonstrate Chainsaw Handling it's important to have a clear to mark trail, not only for ease of access and egress, but for carrying the saw and tools in and out of the falling area. It's important to carry the saw pointing to the rear and on the low side in case of a slip or fall. When starting the saw, no matter what technique the faller is using, the chain brake must be applied. The faller must be in control of the chainsaw at all times and demonstrate the use of a comfortable grip, a three-point stance, and solid footing. The faller should avoid overreaching and always be prepared for kickbacks. Thumbs must be wrapped around the handlebar and the pistol grip. When carrying the chainsaw from tree to tree, the faller must either turn the saw off or engage the chain brake. Part 11, demonstrate the process of falling. It's important that the faller walks the falling area and is aware of all the hazards. And they must be able to demonstrate a proper site assessment and create a step-by-step -step plan in preparation to fall the area. When preparing to fall a tree, it's important to assess the tree from top to bottom for defects and hazards. The faller should determine the lean from the high side of the tree and prepare escape routes a minimum 10 feet to available cover. Part 12, falling a tree. After properly assessing the tree from the high side, the faller should use sight lines to construct the undercut with the saw dogged in. Good body position is critical and cutting from one knee allows the faller to safely see the top of the tree at all times and keep the body aligned to prevent MSI. The faller should engage the chain brick when checking to ensure the undercut is cleaned out and when checking the outside corner holding wood. The axe can be used to knock out the undercut when the cuts don't meet. Before starting the back cut, the faller should remove the duff or bark so a wedge can be placed properly into solid wood. And when wedging is required, the faller should use proper wedging tools and techniques. When the tree is committed to fall, the faller must move away from the stump to cover and wait for the canopy to settle down before returning to the stump. Once there, the faller checks the canopy again before back barring the whiskers off the stump. Back barring of falling cuts should only be used to overcome a specific falling difficulty. Part 13, demonstrate use of axe, wedges, and directional control. Wedging of a tree must be determined before any cuts are made, and it is important that the proper tools and techniques are used. Face screen is used when striking the wedge, and it is absolutely paramount that the faller yeah, well, looks up the tree time. between strikes. The faller must demonstrate good directional control of the tree by using the sight lines on the chainsaw and ensuring a clean and appropriate undercut. There also must be efficient holding wood and an anti-kickback step. Part 14. Recognize dangerous falling practices. The faller must always create a safe area to open. The follows the falling plan using natural openings when possible, and the faller should remove saplings and dangerous trees first. Brushing standing trees unnecessarily with trees being felled is an unacceptable practice. Part 15, manage falling hazards. The faller must be qualified to have skills to safely and professionally deal with falling hazards such as falling trees up slope, heavy leaners, pushing or limb tied trees, and dangerous trees. Part 16, identifying special falling techniques. The faller must demonstrate knowledge about the potential hazards and have the ability to fall small diameter trees against the lean, deal with short stubbies, and be able to refall a cut up tree. Part 17, demonstrate limbing and taping. Yeah, just make sure you got your screen down when you're limbing, eh? The faller must be able to limb and tape a tree safely. So to do that, the faller must assess the tree's stability and check the canopy for overhead hazards. While cutting limbs, taping, and bucking, the faller must be wearing eye and face protection and understand how to control the tape rewind as well as the loaded and supporting limbs. 
Limbs must be cut flush with the bowl of the tree. The follower must be able to choose appropriate log lengths to ensure a safe bucking position, assess bind, and prevent pivot points. And the chain break must be engaged when moving from cut to cut. Party team, demonstrating the bucking process. The bucking process can be evaluated when cutting log lengths, ground debris, or blowdown. Ten of these bucking cuts are assessed to determine that the faller is cutting in a safe manner. Part 19, demonstrate falling cuts. When looking at the falling cuts and scoring the stumps, the most important thing is for the faller to maintain complete control of the tree until it is committed to fall. Control is evident if there is an appropriate undercut that is open, cleaned out enough so the tree can fall freely, and there also must be sufficient holding wood and an anti-kickback step. The undercut percentages of 25 to 40 percent on the evaluation form are established for basic falling situations. However, no two trees are the same, so there is a comment section to explain the faller's decision in the placement of the falling cuts. Therefore, to establish proper stump assessments, the falling supervisor must watch the faller fall the trees. For example, for a tree that is vertical or leans slightly back, 25% of the tree can be cut before the tree starts to lose its structural integrity and become unstable. If the tree leans back heavier, then the faller may decide to only put a 20% undercut to ensure the tree's stability while starting the back cut. This variation to the basic falling standard needs to be noted in the comments section. The qualified supervisor needs to see the tree being felled to make that observation clearly. Your faller is already certified to the basics of the 23-page BC Faller Training Standard Evaluation Form. Now it's important to ensure that the faller is qualified to fall trees in your timber type and terrain. When renewals or upgrades are required, this is the document that must be sent to the BC Forest Safety Council before any new certificates are issued. And since you're dealing with a certified faller already, this document can be completed over a period of time during your regular inspections. Practicing with this document will save time and guarantee no details get missed. We're keeping your operations fast, efficient, and productive. And by working together, we're keeping quality safe. For more information, visit BC4 Safety Council at bc4safe.org.